Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. We thank gospel preacher Paul Nichols of the Stony Point Church of Christ, Kansas City, Kansas, for this sermon on misplaced love. Love is like a golden thread woven throughout the Bible. In John 3, 16, the Bible tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. These passages show God's love for mankind. The Apostle Paul tells us of the love of Christ in Galatians 2:20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. A lawyer once asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was. Jesus said in Mark 12, 30 and 31, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Jesus taught that love for God is the greatest commandment. He said to love our neighbor was important as well. Matthew 22, 39. The Bible tells us not only to love God and love our neighbor, but Jesus says in John 13, verse 34 and 35, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. We prove we are the children of God by our attitude of love toward our brethren. Peter says... Love the brotherhood, 1 Peter 2, 17. We are not only to love those who are compatible with our views and who are our brethren by spiritual relationship, but the Bible tells us to even love our enemies, Matthew 5, 43. The scriptures teach that we are to love our companions in marriage and render unto them due benevolence, 1 Corinthians 7, 3. Paul teaches in Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It is one thing to assert our love and still another to prove it. In 1 John 3, 18, John says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. We prove our love by our attitude and actions. In 1 John 5, 2 and 3, he says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. Jesus also says in John 14, 15, If ye love me, keep my commandments. We prove our love by the way we conduct ourselves one toward another and toward the commandments of God. It is not enough to claim to love. The Word of God requires us to prove it. While the Bible teaches that we are to love God, to love Jesus, to love our neighbors, to love our enemies, to love our wives, and to love the brotherhood, the Bible prohibits us from loving some things. If we love these things, we are misplacing our love and not setting our affections upon things above. Colossians 3 verses 1 and 2. Misplaced love after our song.
First, we can misplace our love by having too much affection for money. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. A person will sometimes say that the Bible teaches that money is the root of all evil. Not true. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Not just rich people are guilty of this misplaced love. Judas, one of the 12 apostles, was guilty of this sin. The Bible tells us he carried the bag. That is, he was the treasurer for the other apostles and for our Lord. His love for money went, the money that went into the bag was so great, he was unable to see the good. The action of the woman who anointed the head of Jesus with spikes of penitence could have been sold and the proceeds given to the poor. Mark 14, 1 through 5, John 12, 3 through 6. The Bible informs us that this was not really his concern. His interest lay in what went into that bag. It was his avaricious attitude that led him to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. The love of money truly is the root of all evil. Do anything for money. In Acts 5, 1 through 11, punishment was meted out to Ananias and Sapphira because they loved money too much. They loved it so much that they were willing to pretend they were giving all to the Lord while holding back a part for themselves. They were trying to deceive the apostles, the other disciples, and the Lord. They paid for it with hell forever. The love of money is dangerous, and we must guard against it. It is all right for us to provide well for ourselves and our families. In fact, the Bible teaches us in 1 Timothy 5 a that if we do not provide for our own, and especially for those of our own house, we have denied the faith and are worse than infidels. The danger lies in loving money. The next misplaced love is the love of pleasure. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 4, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and holy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. I truly believe we are living in such a time. We are living in an age when people are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Fun games are the order of the day. In 1 Timothy 5, 5 and 6, Paul says, Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. She dies spiritually while she fulfills the lust of her flesh and enjoys the titillating pleasures of this world. Anyone who is familiar with the teaching of the New Testament has heard of the prodigal son who went to his aged father and demanded his inheritance, Luke 15, 11 through 24. The old man gave his son what would have been his at his father's death. The young men then left home and went out into the world and spent all that on riotous living. He did those things which would bring him worldly pleasure, but which brought shame and reproach upon himself and upon his father. One day he realized that he had spent all and he had to get a job. There was a great famine and the only job he could find was feeding swine. While he was feeding the hogs, he watched them eat the husks of the corn. The Bible tells us he would fain have filled his belly with the husks because he was so hungry. But at that moment, he came to himself. He realized he did not have to be there. He could return home to his father. He was in such shame that he decided he would go back home and admit he had sinned against his father and against heaven. He would ask for no better place than that of a hired hand upon his father's farm. He went home, and when he arrived, his father killed the fatted calf, threw a robe about his shoulders, and rejoicing and merrymaking at the old home place because the young man came home where he belonged. 
This story ended well. Sadly, all wayward sons and daughters do not return before it is too late. Some Christians depart from the faith, leave the Heavenly Father, and fail to return. They die unprepared and will be lost forever. Truly, the love of pleasure is the road that leads to hell. The Bible condemns the love of the world. In 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17, the Apostle John says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth her. We can see that any love we have for the world is misplaced love. In James 4, verse 4, the apostle says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore of God, concerning one of his co-workers, Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, 10, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. If a man loves the world, he is an enemy of God. Let us clarify this point. This passage does not mean we cannot love the people of the world. The Bible tells us God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He wants to love the same things God loved, that is, the people in the world. It's not wrong to love the creation of God either. When the Bible says, love not the world, it does not mean we cannot love the beauty of God's creation. David says in Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. We can enjoy these things that glorify God. When the Bible prohibits loving the world, it is talking about the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. A Christian must not love those things that are sinful and wrong. Another misplaced love is the love of dark 20, and this is the condemnation. The light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Judas was a person who loved darkness rather than light. Even though he had the privilege of serving Jesus as an apostle, he chose to sell his Lord for 30 pieces of silver and identified himself with the enemies of Christ. The end of Judas, of course, was death by his own hand and eternal damnation after judgment. Millions today live in darkness and have no desire to do otherwise. They have lived all their lives in iniquity, worldly pleasure, darkness of sin, and lasciviousness. If the gospel were preached to them, most would reject the teaching. Christ came into the world and brought the light, but men loved darkness rather than light and rejected him. The same is true today. All the preaching that can be done will not save the soul of a person who has no desire to walk in the light. God forces no one to serve him, but allows us the privilege of being his children through obedience to the gospel. Paul says, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness, Romans 6:16. 6, Christ became, Hebrews 5 verse 9, the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. If a person wants to obey the gospel, that is fine. God has given him that right. But then we cannot walk in the light and live in darkness at the same time. The Bible also condemns self-love. Such love is misplaced. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 and 2, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. On the other hand, Paul admonishes Christians in Romans 12, verse 3, 
For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Paul mandates that we are not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. There is nothing wrong with having self-respect, but to love ourselves so much that we have a selfish attitude is contrary to Christian principles. One must deny himself in order to follow Jesus. The Bible says in Matthew 16, 24 and 25, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Next, the love of man's praise is also a misplaced love. We read in John 12, verse 42 and 43, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. It is a mistake for any person who understands the truth for fear of reprisals or for fear of an adverse reaction by his friends. The Bible teaches we are to love God more than anything else in the world. It's certainly wrong to love the praise of man more than the praise of God. Paul writes in Galatians 1.10, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? Or if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. There are many preachers who love the praise of men to the extent that they will withhold teachings of the Bible. They fear hurting someone's feelings. They fear losing the praise that they would have from these people. One poet wrote, Preach a sermon, preacher, but make it short and sweet. Our stomachs strike at 12 o'clock, a hungering for to eat. Preach a sermon, preacher, with words both smear. For philosophy, we're a-thirsting. For scripture, we don't care. Preach a sermon, preacher, punctuate it with jokes. Fill it with your yarns and tales and entertain us, folks. Preach a sermon, preacher, we care not what you say as long as you leave us alone and fire some other way. Preach a sermon, preacher, but don't get too specific. As long as you will generalize, we think you are terrific. Preach a sermon, preacher, make it good and plain. But don't you dare get so close so as to call sin by its name. Preach a sermon, preacher, preach it round or flat. We love to play at hide and seek and wonder where you were at. Preach a sermon, preacher, make it what we love to hear. We will pat you on your spineless back while you scratch our itching ear. Some are guilty of the love of preeminence. We read of such an individual in 3 John, verse 9. John says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Paul warns in Acts 20, verse 29 and 30, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Paul foretold that there would be members of the body of Christ who would rise up and try to draw away disciples. They would seek for preeminence of leadership, the love of the proper spirit of the Christian. Paul teaches in Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In our lesson, we have noticed misplaced love of money, of pleasure, of the world, of darkness, of self, of praise, and finally, of preeminence. Let us manifest true love and guard against misplaced love. Misplaced love can destroy pure Christian love and, the <clears throat> and thus rob us of a home in heaven. It is just not worth the price. Heaven is too beautiful, hell is too hot, and eternity is too long. If one is guilty of misplaced love, he should turn around before it is too late. 
Stay with us and we'll tell you how to get a free copy of this message after our song. So Have you declared the proper love and allegiance to God, your Father, and demonstrated your love and appreciation to Jesus for what He did for you at the cross and for what the Holy Spirit has done in providing for us the testimony of the Word of God, the establishment of the church that Jesus set up? Have you demonstrated that? We hope you will consider carefully these words. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. In Acts 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you haven't taken these steps, we hope you'll contact us. We'd be happy to help you with that. Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. We encourage you to call or write for a copy of this message. You can request our free Bible study course that you can complete at home. Send in the first lesson. We'll return it after we grade it and send you lesson two and so forth. You can join our Facebook group page for a daily Bible verse and weekly updates of the message in your area. Visit our YouTube channel or letthebiblespeak.com to watch videos of the program at your convenience. Finally, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 16, verse 16, the churches of Christ, and God bless. For a free copy of today's sermon, write to Let the Bible Speak, P.O. Box 10731, Springfield, Missouri, 65808. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you each Sunday morning at this time by the following churches.
See the 